Okay. Well, we want to thank you all for taking your time to come out tonight to share this evening of learning about the burning issue of our age. Um, we have been witnessing an incredible humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, and it also is a profound medical crisis. And I'm just so grateful to Dr. Mark Posdansky for bringing us this amazing panel here of Dr. Polina Tesler, Maria Hutchins. It's just incredible to have each of you here, these esteemed doctors, to share your view and, and your vision of what you're seeing as the medical needs in Ukraine. And, and more importantly, how you are finding a way to make an impact. There are times when all of us feel helpless and each of you are facing that helplessness and saying, we're going to meet it with a hug. Mark, you shared with me in one of our earliest conversations that Heal Ukraine Group has the acronym of HUG. And so I just want to begin by inviting each of you to tell us about yourself and what drew you to take action now in this way in Ukraine. Well, Mark, if you'll start yeah, us off. I'll start off and firstly, thank you, Michelle, for giving us this opportunity. The, 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 the three of us on the, on, on the call currently, the, there's a fourth waiting to come on, waiting for his a cover. Uh, he's a pediatric anesthesiologist, Gennady Fuzelov, who, who will be on shortly. He's just waiting for his cover to get to the hospital so that he can join the call. He's another remarkable physician. And th this is the principle of HUG. It's multiple amazing physicians that I've been privileged to meet with and talk to and collaborate with to try and help in this situation. But to your, to your point, Michelle, and it's hard to dive in on a you know Wednesday evening out of the out of a day of work and whatever people have been doing and just face the fact that we're facing such a dramatic situation and I remember sort of coming down a little bit in February from the COVID pandemic and thinking about the sort of viral pathogen and got it somewhat under control but being very aware as a British citizen originally that you know there were 150,000 so Russian soldiers on a border and having been brought up at schools in England, we were taught the history of Europe. And when that number of soldiers, tanks, artillery appear on a border, uh, that is not an insignificant moment. And given that um, we've seen it all played out in 1939 previously, uh, we were, you know, as People who are aware of history were like, what is going to happen next and what will happen next is going to be serious. So on February the 24th, it struck me for the first time that never again was going to happen again. And it wasn't going to be five years later that we were going to realize that never again happened again. It was going to be February the 25th that ne never again was going to happen again and that we were going to have to act now to address the never again. And that's what drew me in. There's one other little remarkable thing about never again, is that earlier in February, our family found out for the first time, the names of all of our family members who died in the Holocaust. Mm. Um, so that was 70, 80 years later, after the Holocaust, a family, our family was finding out about how, where, why, names of young and old who had died in the Holocaust. It'd be the irony that a few weeks later, I'm thinking never again is just happening again, is, was inconceivable to me, but it caused me to, as I said, act now and work out what we can do to avert the, the coming disaster. Wow, Mark, thank you so much. Paulina, you, you're in front of that beautiful mural too. Thank you everybody uh, for, for joining this. My name is Paulina Tesler. I was born in Lviv, Ukraine in, in the Soviet era. And um, 
immigrated to the Boston area in 1989 with my parents and grew up here. And um, now I'm a psychiatrist at the Brigham. Um, we still have family in Ukraine. We like a lot of people from the region. We have family in Russia and uh, Estonia and Sweden. So the whole area is um, special and near to us. Um, you're alluding to my, my background. So one of the ways um, we got involved right away is we do still have family in Ukraine. Um, my aunt and uncle live in Lviv. And right away, of course, it was what's happening. Are you okay? What do you need? And it was things like helmets, bulletproof vests, um, insulin. Um, and as they became experts in logistics and acquisitions, we tried to help however we could from our end. Um, you know, being Jewish from Eastern Europe, of course, my family is also uh, Holocaust survivors and actually um, my grandmother's younger sister who survived uh, the Holocaust is in Lviv now. And so as, as Mark was saying, this like, it is again, it is exactly again. Um, in, and um, when the war started, she was drafted into the army and served as a medic. And now my 20 year old cousin volunteered to serve as a medic. So it's, it's scary, it's real. Uh, um, the image is actually um, from Lithuania, children who had uh, escaped with their mothers we're sending it back to as a thank you to the soldiers. And so now when they're packing supplies for the soldiers, they're including this artwork to kind of keep up their morale. And I thought that everybody should see that. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Maria, tell us about yourself and your involvement. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, although the uh, the reason why we're all here is not um, so pleasurable, unfortunately. My background is as follows. I was born in Moscow to um, a Jewish family uh, and came to the United States in uh, 1991. Uh, became educated here and I'm now a neurologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. My um, grandmother, uh, a fully 100% Jewish grandmother, was born in Kharkov, Ukraine and went to medical school there. And then just like in Polina's family's case, served as a physician uh, in the Second World War, basically got herself drafted, um, volunteered to serve and uh, spend the entire war being a, a doctor uh, in the, with, with the moving army in, in the front, on the front lines, um, as did my grandfather. And they, they met at the war and they married uh, there and then my mom was born and so forth. So uh, also, you know, Holocaust um, touched my family as did Stalin's gulags and um, a whole host of other issues that there's a wonderful book called Bloodlands. I highly recommend that you read that if you haven't yet. It's about that whole part of the world and how terribly tragic the, the history of that world is, that part of the world is. Uh, I got involved with HUG through uh, our uh, mutual friend, Nellie. Um, I know Nellie, she's a, a wonderful surgeon at the Brigham and is from Ukraine as well. And she has been involved with Ukraine with health missions there even prior to the war. And then the war just put it all in a, in a new spotlight. Uh, I've been involved prior to joining HUG uh, with different Jewish volunteer organizations here in town uh, through Centra Makor, through other ways and, and uh, 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 opportunities to give, uh, donate money and also collect medical supplies from various hospitals, get them packaged, get them shipped specifically to hospitals in need in Ukraine. And that's been my involvement so far and uh, we're expanding it obviously and HUG is gonna give us all the opportunity to very meaningfully contribute to this effort. So thank mm. you for inviting me. So Maria, I'm so fascinated with your background because we hear a lot about uh, Russians over here and Ukrainians over here that there's been a, a big division coming out. And here you are acting on behalf of uh, Ukrainians as a person with a Russian background. Can you share with us the complexity of that or, or is there complexity about that for you? 
Well, I'm Jewish ethnically. I was born in Russia, but um, and I speak Russian <laughs> language. I don't speak Ukrainian, but my self-perception right now is that of an American Jew mm. with an advantage of speaking Russian and understanding the paradigms of that part of the world helping Ukraine. And there is no, there's no question in my mind, there is no duality of any kind. I mean, I understand very clearly who is the aggressor, who is a defender and what is right and what is wrong. And there's, there's a very, um, it's very striking, the clarity, both for myself and, and all my family and all my friends. I mean, we're all exactly the same. My husband is from Belarus, also Jewish, but he was born in Minsk. You know, it's, it's all connected like this, right? But, but the clarity is there. It doesn't matter where you're born, you know. Mm. I, as a rabbi, I love that point, particularly um, because you are acting out of your Jewish background. And I want to ask each of the three of you, uh, what about your Jewish background has motivated you to step in um, on a medical front? Is there something in particular in our Maria teachings? Said, you know I just want to add to what Maria said, you know, when this first started in late February, one of um, my very close friends reached out to my husband and goes, I'm so confused. I thought Paulina was Russian um, because even though I was born in Lviv, I, I don't speak Ukrainian. Um, my grandparents were born in Ukraine and we, we were all Russian speaking. Um, and until February 24th, I would have never introduced myself to anyone as a Ukrainian person because it's different. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's so important to keep that in mind that these like, the trying to erase something, to trying to erase the people and claiming that there's no difference. It didn't start February 24th. Hmm. It didn't even start in 2014, right? It started in, depending on which historian you wanna ascribe it to, it started a very, very long time ago and it's sort of the continuation of what happened in the 30s and what happened in the 50s and what happened in Tsarist Russia, um, trying to sort of blur the boundaries and say like, well, we're all the same, but at the same time erasing mm. the, the differences. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I would add that um, there's something about <clears throat> The, the, the proximity of history here as a Jew, uh, a Jewish boy myself growing up in London, hearing about the Second World War, seeing the documentaries, learning the history that, you know, in a, in a way these stories can get lost generation upon generation. That's the inevitability of humans sort of repeating the same errors over and over again. And I think that the, the point about that is that, um, that we're compelled, I think, as Jews to act in this particular situation. I think we know what the scale of the losses are. And I'm saying are in the sense that the news is reporting this and the news is reporting that, but it was only five years after the end of the, uh, five years after the beginning of the Second World War that we began to learn that millions upon millions of people had actually died during the Second World War. And of course, it took a while to even come to the conclusion that six million Jews had died. The same is going on now in Ukraine. We're being told that there are hundreds here. We're told a personal story about one person dying there. Hundreds of people are dying in this context. And, and we will only find out about it when the fog of war clears and who knows exactly when that's going to be. And I think that's the compulsion to act now that as a Jew, you know what's going on. And I think one of the most terrifying things is the discussion we hear about one day filtration camps where Ukrainians are being sorted and moved into Russia. There's been one or two personal reports about what's been happening at filtration camps. As Jews, we know the various different names that are used for these types of things that appear to be either banal 
like concentration camps or, or resettlement camps or whatever. So I think Jewish people are aware of all of the meaning of the words in this context and what those words ultimately will lead to. So that leads into the question about so many of us feel so powerless to act in the face of such magnitude. What specifically are each of you doing? You know, each of you have decided to go from a medical perspective, um, but you're also going into places where others are not going. Can you share with us your specific role in the Heal Ukraine group, what you're doing, and um, how you're able to do it? Mm -hmm. And I see that Gennady has joined us. Um, so if you'd like to, to answer that question first and tell us a little bit about yourself as part of, of that answer. Yes, I apologize for being late. I stuck in the operating room and Mark will later send me a hundred e uh, texts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that holy work. Uh, so I'm sorry. I, uh, I was stuck and it's uh, like we have a shortage of people because a number of uh, physicians get sick from COVID. And um, if I can share the screen with you, I prepare this uh, host disabled participant screen share. Uh, Caitlin, like can you let him share, please? Perfect. You're, you're all set. All right. Let me do this again. Okay. Share. And um, do you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, uh, first of all, Mark, thank you for invitation. And thank you guys for um, letting me talk in front of you. Uh, my name is Gennady Fuselov. I am a physician from Mass General Hospital and Shriners Hospital where I have been working for the last 20 years. And I remember um, uh, last um, century, uh, we came here as a refugee uh, to Baltimore, Maryland, and the uh, Jewish Family Services um, um, uh, um, home us in Baltimore. And the person who took care of us was Felix Kostenberg. He was... Uh, mm. Uh, the guy who went through the Nazis camp uh, in back in the Second World War. And by engaging with this uh, kind of philanthropic approach to us, it's a trigger or uh, forced me to um, uh, kind of giving back um, um, uh, mentality. And after, um, uh, during my training at the Children's Hospital, I joined uh, Doctors Without Border. And I was working with different um, nonprofit organizations uh, during my um, uh, physician career. And I have been done more than 67 uh, medical missions all over the world. And the um, last uh, uh, 14 uh, uh, or 16 years, I have been working uh, with Ukraine. We've done an uh, 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 annual mission to Ukraine. And I um, uh, basically, we started with this um, in 2005 when President uh, Yushchenko became a president after the Orange Re Re Revolution. This little girl, um, Anastasia, uh, uh, yeah, had an injury uh, from flame uh, from a house which got in fire, and she tried to save her sister by pulling her out from the house. And she uh, get uh, severely burned, and um, he uh, addressed this issue to the world community. And uh, she was brought to Shriners Hospital, Boston, uh, for the treatment. It was in two thousand five, and um, uh, this is um, another kid who just mm -hmm. recently um, uh, 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 came. Uh, recently, it's mean in uh, November 2000, I mean, uh, tw uh, 2021, during the COVID time. And it was uh, one of my uh, transfer uh, before mm -hmm. the war. And this is 12 year old kid uh, who had 27,000 uh, uh, volt high voltage uh, electrical injury. And um, you can see this aircraft, which brought him here with uh, four stops uh, from uh, Ukraine to Boston. Okay. And to totally, I was able to bring um, 
uh, close to 67 kids. Wow. And most uh, recent um, most recent work was uh, uh, bringing to the Shriners Hospital two acute patient toddlers and two uh, older kids uh, uh, for the treatment at Shriners Hospital. And one a kid, uh, 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 a war-related injury, I was able to bring to um, Georgia, uh, to, to Augusta, Georgia, and flying the, uh, uh, flying the aircraft uh, from uh, Europe or from, uh, from U- Ukraine, uh, it's pretty challenging because the uh, sure. prices for uh, gasoline doubled and uh, um, fee for air transport, it used to be seventy-five to $80,000. Uh, and uh, the transfer to Georgia was $143,000. Wow. So you've been doing this work for quite some time yeah. now. How have things shifted and changed since the war began? And what's the medical situation on the ground now? Well, um, it's, uh, uh, let me... Um, uh, and if, if you'll bring us back together. Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, difficult to comment the situation there uh, because it's always, um, it's, uh, always changing, especially like for today. If you heard the news, the whole Ukraine was uh, uh, bombed, the uh, whole uh, uh, train station in the western part of Ukraine and Dnipro was, ba- uh, was bombed. And there is no like a, a numbers from uh, uh, how many uh, people get injured. And I just want to uh, give you a bark. Uh, there's only nine soldiers who was evacuated outside of Ukraine for the treatment. And, um, and uh, to the United States, trauma-related injury was transferred just recently uh, uh, by me in, uh, to Georgia Augusta. And total is five kids being uh, transport here during the uh, conflict started. And transfer the, the children from Ukraine now, it's more difficult since the previous path, which uh, developed for uh, uh, many years, uh, uh, get broken because embassy in Ukraine doesn't work. Right. And uh, we cannot go to Ukraine. We have to bring them to the Poland. So we basically introducing the different var- uh, variables, Poland uh, health system, because um, they need to be admitted to the hospital and they need to wait for us uh, to come with the aircraft. So it, mm-hmm. it's a very complicated. So this transfer, which we did to Shriners Hospital took me 22 days. Wow. So what was already complicated has become more complicated. I want to invite the other voices as well. Thank you so much, Gennady, about the current medical situation on the ground. What has become more complex? What what are you doing there? I can make a comment about that from just hearing from people who are actually there. So, you know, one of the things that's very challenging is that um, the Russian army deliberately targets hospitals um, and healthcare givers, ambulances, to the point where like things with Red Cross insignia have to be hidden. Um, Instead of, you know, normal operations, they're obviously having issues with supply chains and delivering things to various parts of the country. And one of the things that they have been adapting with is that instead of using ambulances, they use like uh, armored vehicles, you know, like, like what we would normally see for like bank transportation. Mm-hmm. But even a vehicle like that has an average life expectancy of less than 24 hours. I, I, I was going to add that um, Gennady and Paulina sort of referring to this as the scale of the impact on healthcare. If you imagine a country at war of a population of 44 million people with disruptions to medical services across the board, even where, let's say, Lviv is less impacted by war than, let's say, the eastern part of Ukraine, like Kharkiv and so forth, it it meant that 300,000 people moving to the west are now impacting the healthcare system from the east to the west. And then even beyond that, and this is very, very important to understand 
and I, I just want to transmit this in addition to those people who are displaced and requiring medical care within the country that's completely disrupted by a countrywide war. And Gennady alluded to this with attacks on stations and uh, rockets recently in, um, in, uh, in, in state and in, across the country is that you have 3 million or more people who've left the country and are refugees requiring health care in Poland, Romania, Hungary, and beyond. So the scale of the health care crisis is nothing. And I repeat, nothing like anything that we've seen. And it cannot even be touched on by reportage from CNN, Reuters, wherever, Fox News, you name it, doesn't matter. This is countrywide. Uh, and, and we are only seeing the very tip of the iceberg with regards to the impact on, on health care for the population at this time. So I, I completely agree. And I would also add just so that we can kind of understand how, how this works uh, in general, right? So there's, there's war-related health-related problem, right? The problems, uh, acute injury, sharp null injury, you know, direct hits. So the, all the trauma that requires surgical supplies surgeons, anesthesiologists, operating rooms, ideally. Uh, so that's one problem. Another problem is all the acute illnesses that happen in the setting of stress and crisis, all the heart attacks, mm -hmm. all the strokes, all the bleedings from the GI tract, all that, right? So that's separate. Then there are chronic problems that people have all the time, you know, hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol problems, thyroid disease, multiple sclerosis, you know, you name it, epilepsy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then there are also issues that are of a psychosocial nature and so, uh, social emotional problems, behavioral problems, psychiatric problems that are a direct result of the war, the state of war, right? And so each of these pieces is, it, it kind of needs to be addressed, cannot be addressed effectively in the current situation. And um, each, each of these pieces needs different kinds of resources and different kinds of support. And so I think the HUG group, as well as many other organizations, um, are trying to sort of tackle, you know, each little bit or a larger bit at the time. And that's hmm. just so that you can have a, a kind well, of. A I think I should that. add it to what the, uh, you are common that um, I don't think Ukraine now in the position even to have a rough evaluation in terms of humanitarian crisis. Hmm. When I hmm. ask Minister of Health he cannot comment this because they have a different agenda to defend, to fight. And uh, I don't think they even close in the position to be alarmed like we alarm because we, underst we understand that uh, the, 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 the most health system get destroyed. I'm sorry for mm. interruption, Marie. Yeah, no, I, actually that leads into my next question for all of you, which is, you know, we when we see medical stories about Ukraine, they're usually about war injuries, but with so many crowded into place, both as refugees inside of Ukraine and in surrounding countries, what are you seeing in terms of things that we're dealing with, like COVID infections or other infectious diseases on the rise? I think COVID probably was cured in Ukraine tempor tempor temporarily, right? It's just become a non-issue because everything else has taken over. Uh, I'm sure they still have COVID. I mean, I'm trying to kind of be lighthearted about it. I'm sure that's still the issue there, as, as is the flu and the strep throat and everything else. I just don't think people, you know, are, in a, as Gennady said, it's just, it's just not even secondary. It's down, you know, below the number 100 down there somewhere. So All resources now concentrated in different area. The only West and United States alarming in terms of health issue there. And even like a, even if you look at the capacity that the, in the Poland there is a ten thousand uh, uh, bed hospital ready to to uh, uh, to bring the injured patient, and but there is no need for that. So there is no process of evacuation of the injured people from Ukraine. If you look even like Poland hospital, they're not overwhelmed because they don't have a patient from the Ukraine. So Meaning people can't get out or people aren't wanting to get out? 
different in both. Maybe there is a, another reason because they don't have resources for that. Mm-hmm. Because like uh, uh, my recent uh, interaction with the Minister of Health, where I push him to designate uh, the special people for evacuation process. And they start working just for the last couple of weeks. Before that, this process did not exist. Sorry for interruption again, Maria. Yeah, I, I, I think the additional point, and I'd, I'd like Paulina maybe to mention the uh, beyond the physical illnesses that are, that are happening here, is that you know, there's there's a thing in medicine which is sort of, you know, you have doctors and you have nurses and you have healthcare workers, but there's a lot of common sense in medicine, which is in the context of war, pretty much all of the things that you alluded to, infectious diseases, are extremely significant. Mm. Um, we know that in war, you can lose a third of people simply because of infection of their wounds. So not being able to get them antibiotics or cleaning their shrapnel wound or dressing their wound appropriately will lead to the death of people. That, that's because we know what the anti, antibiotic revolution led to in the Second World War and in the Korean War and the Vietnam War, which revolutionized the way we were able to save people who were injured. Well, I guarantee you the people who get injured, it's just in its nature. People will have infections, whether it's COVID or infections of their wounds, and they will not be getting the adequate treatment that they need. Or, or cholera or typhoid or, right. you know, all the classics. Yeah. In, all, Nikolaev, all the things, yeah. in Nikolaev, they don't have a water for three and a half weeks. Three and a half weeks, no water. Mariupol, the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So basically, uh, you can imagine what the issue they will face. They probably had this issue. But like it, I was able to ship the Dnipro uh, 36 uh, filter for the water because the whole infrastructure was damaged. And something as simple as a water filter. Yeah, is so basically kind of one, thing. one small water filter from which working from the uh, regular car engine able to serve about a couple thousand people in the small v- village. What are the medical goods, supplies, services that people need, and how do you get them there? They need everything, right? They need absolutely everything, and some things are harder than others. Like insulin was one of the first things that was requested, and one of the difficulties with that is it needs refrigeration. So getting it from Boston to Ukraine is not so easy. You don't just put it in a FedEx box. But now I think from at least, Mark, I think you would agree, like what we're hearing most now, and it may be because our group has a surgical uh, uh, weight (laughs) to it, but it's it's tourniquets. It's a a device called a wound vac, which is something that you would apply to help heal wounds like after a surgery or after an amputation. Um, It's gauze. It's, It's really like, combat first aid essentially is what they're really asking for, but they need everything. They need chemo drugs. They need blood pressure drugs. They need medications. From from my perspective, from what we heard as neurology um, specialists, seizure drugs, anti-seizure drugs rather, right? So there are some things that people can sort of get by without and others that they absolutely can't insulin is one if you don't take insulin you die if you have diabetes type one or insulin requiring diabetes thyroid medication if you don't get thyroid replacement you're going to die eventually Uh, if you um, don't have anti-epileptics you're also very likely going to die going into status epilepticus and and dying so there are some things that are just critical even from a day-to-day chronic care situation and that's very very much needed and um, the way we're getting it there is we uh, either, uh, you know, there, there are ways to get to, to get money to volunteers and they buy it in Europe, in Poland or elsewhere, and then they truck it into the country, hoping that they don't get bombed on the way. And so then, th- then the supplies get distributed to hospitals there, clinics there, or we buy what we can here and uh, we ship it through the help of the uh, a Ukrainian sort of run shipping company that's been very supportive of, of, of the missions here called MIST. Uh, and so then they get it to Poland and then also they truck it from Poland to Ukraine. Yeah, I think- Also I think, one, one suitcase at a time. 
One that's, suitcase at a time. And, and, yep. and, uh, that's fully really the that's, most common way that things are getting there right now is literally a suitcase at a time. And there's a very good analogy here, which is important for the people on the court to understand is, and the analogy is actually with Dunkirk. In, in Dunkirk, they were unable to get the big battleships into the beaches to get over 100,000 British troops off the beaches uh, of, uh, on the French coast at the beginning of the, first, uh, beginning of the Second World War. As a result, they sent little ships, hundreds and hundreds of little private boats to, to, to fulfill a probably the most important military mission of the early part of the, of the Second World War. And it's that ingenuity that is occurring exactly as Polina says, suitcases at, at a time, white van at a time, people driving all the way across Poland and then Ukraine to deliver to specific locations, specific lists of materials and hug as part of its network, wherever it can fill a little gap. And these are little gaps, but you know, little ships, little boats, as it were, we are trying to do that. And you can achieve an enormous amount. You know, you think, well, we want the Red Cross to act to do all of this, or we want the UN to act. I think we've seen that they can't. Uh, for the first time, we saw the head of the UN in Ukraine saying, the war must stop. Yeah. It's evil. Well, all power to him for stating that and being in Ukraine to state that, but there's a boatload, literally boats load of other things that need to be done in the meantime, while the main uh, protagonist in this, you know, the Russian army led by Putin is not has no intention of stopping any of this. So, um, yeah. Little it's, by little. You know, it's, funny if, go ahead. it's funny that I say it's, it's one suitcase at a time, but it's actually, it's not one suitcase because we're lucky that unlike in the 30s and 40s, we have social media now. And so what, it, what really happens is that somebody says, I'm traveling on the 24th from this location to this location. And then they get inundated with take this, take this, take this. Like, there's a great photograph from one of the organizations that was on from Ukraine. They had volunteers helping on both ends, but one person flew with 36 pieces of luggage. Hmm. Hmm. And and so small ships, one suitcase or 36 suitcases at a time. Uh, we have a question from a member here. Thank, it starts with a thank you. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And, you know, everyone's trying to do their part. And she wants to know from you, what is the most effective way that we can assist in your efforts to contribute to fulfill these medical needs? I can start it, Mark. Go ahead. So I have an agenda to join this meeting. <laughs> I have to make a full disclosure. First of all, uh, my agenda is to be introduced to the Jewish community in Newton, since I get married in Newton. And the second agenda is to appreciate you guys for hosting this and Mark to organize this. And the short answer how to assist is, um, I mean, personally what I'm doing, is uh, uh, more funding I have, more kids I can bring here, I can bring to United States. I just uh, sent on the uh, group chat uh, the, the link to my organization. And if, uh, I mean, this is what I'm doing. And uh, also I'm working with GDC and Jewish uh, agency for, for Israel to help a re refugee in Poland. And I will stop here and I'm gonna let other people talk. Thank you. Please, um, Maria, since uh, we have you here, if you'll share. Um, yes, absolutely. So uh, thank you all very much for joining us and, and, and hearing us out. We really do appreciate it. I think HUG, the organization that we represent here this evening, is really a hub. HUG, hub, they kind of sound similar, but it is a hub. Right, so it's think of it as a like think of it as a subway. So there are multiple subway stations, and then there's a central sort of hub of subway stations. Different lines come here. So from here, we can then um, funnel resources to um, organizations um, that get that will purchase supplies um, and get them to where they're needed. Uh, that's one one 
aspect. Another one is what Gennady is doing that's different. He's bringing people who need help, who cannot get help there. He's trying to bring these people here to the United States or somewhere in Europe to provide care, especially children, children who need um, orthopedic or uh, other types of um, support that they cannot get locally. Right, and then our colleagues are doing a lot of work as well related to edu medical education, cancer education, and, and Mark can talk more about that as well. Mm. And uh, if one of you will will post the hug information into the the chat or send it to Caitlin and she'll do that um, as Mark, you, you answer, and then I have another question for you all. Yeah, I was going to emphasize that at a time like this with a, a, with a really a, cat, a catastrophe of this scale, every piece happens. I, you know, I was just speaking to my wife, Ivona. She had spoken to her friend who's an artist. She has a painting that she did of some sunflowers. She'd like to auction it to help raise money for, for one of the NGOs that is supporting everything from that to that background that Paulina has uh, behind her to material, financial, uh, we, we had a marvelous person who went around her clinical space and collected all of those things that she could, that she felt, you know, under the regulations of the U.S. Had, had, would, be, would otherwise be potentially discarded. There are things like surgical kits that are discarded with sell-by dates and things like that. And uh, she just sent us, you know, 12 boxes of various different medical equipment so it runs the gamut there's one last thing i want to mention because maria mentioned this which was education so in the same way we've been hosting afghan refugees there's a great need to host uh, medical students nursing students cancer research experts who cannot complete their work and training during the war, and I, I, one tiny anecdote, I went to medical school in Edinburgh and there was a plaque in, in the courtyard of this very ancient school which said, this was where the Polish medical school in exile existed during the duration of the Second World War. So for five years, the, as much of the Polish medical school for, in Warsaw was moved to Edinburgh so that Polish medical students could continue their education until the end of the war when they returned to Warsaw. I, I never understood the impact of that until these last few weeks, the importance of what Edinburgh Medical School did. Uh, I would pass that sign every day and think, what was what's that about? Now I realize we have to do the same thing. And I'm you're saying we can do that? Sorry, you're saying we can do that? We There are medical students here right now in Boston who need we, a place to be? To, we have to be able to do that. And I'm pressing the Harvard Medical School and other medical schools to begin to think about what they would have to do to achieve that. Mm. Michelle, can I ask you a question? Please. So you find wait, 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 like, Paulina first and then, uh, yeah. I just wanted to add, you know, Related to what Mark was saying about the medical students, there also has to be political pressure and advocacy yes. because right now the only way for a Ukrainian refugee to legally enter this country is at the Mexican border, which does not make any sense. We um, just like how Gennady was saying about you know Jewish communities welcoming refugees from the Soviet Union, we have a system for this. We've done this before. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you. Gennady, you have a question for me. Yes. So I uh, try to be very practical and pragmatic. And uh, Mark probably going to hate me for that. No. But uh, I guess uh, I, if I bring the soldiers here, will uh, your temple assist me to host them for the social need? What do you mean the social need? Well, I, I think I can, uh, if I find the hospital which will provide the medical yeah. uh, 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 help, I guess as soon as they get out of the hospital, if I find them the housing, they still need to be 
uh, are taken care of by, uh, by volunteers. And I guess I want to ask you guys, how can I reach you? If I can, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up to help. And, uh, and can, my can you send me your information that... so I can have your phone on my speed dial? A thousand percent, a thousand percent would welcome the opportunity to be Excellent. part of doing and, that. Uh, I can write down your phone number for information. Yes, well, I'll make sure to get it to you after. You All right, um, thank you guys. So speaking of that, but actually speaking of those emotional needs, that's something that I'm really interested in, concerned about right now, because we talk a lot about the immediate medical needs and they, they need everything there medically, but we know that historically, and now those who survive through war also have mental health needs and emotional needs and social needs. What are you seeing in terms of mental health needs? Are you seeing them yet or are they still being pushed down? And how might we be able to help meet those needs? You know, that, that is such a complicated question. The needs are there. Of course they're there. These are human beings. Are we seeing them? No. Um, because there's not an opportunity to see them because there's like too much stuff going on. But, you know, one of the headlines was Russian soldiers took over a psychiatric hospital. I can't imagine that they were taking very good care of the ill patients there. Um, probably in times of evacuation, you know, historically patients with severe mental health issues were not like sort of first priority to get to safety, not to mention and the trauma of just hearing, you know, air raid sirens every day, children spending their whole time in basements, being separated from their family members, family members not being able to reach each other, the things they're seeing. We know from, again, from history, from our experience with the Holocaust, that the effects of those traumas are seen in the DNA of grandchildren. So these, they're, they're, the traumas are very significant and they're going to be felt for generations. And what to do about that, we're trying to figure it out. Mm. There are some organizations I'm working with that are trying to figure out if there's a way to do telepsychiatry into Ukraine and Poland right now. It's got obstacles. I think, it, I think it'll get there. It makes me really sad to think that we will have time to get there because um, I don't think this is going to end very soon. But, but the trauma is there. And especially for the elderly generation, like, it's, it's all over again. Like they've, they've been through this and it's happening all over again. Mm, Paulina, thank you so much on that. Um, you know, a question about the long-term consequences. You so beautifully helped answer what we might be facing as a mental health crisis moving forward due to the trauma. What about the global food crisis that is being created right now? You know, we hear a lot about Ukraine as the breadbasket of Europe. From a medical standpoint, what impact does the collapse of supply lines for food growth and distribution in Ukraine have for those there and in the surrounding areas We're, now and in the years even, ahead? Even up yeah, even outside the medical, we're going to see that in our own star market. Really? Because, yeah, Ukraine was some of the seventh largest supplier of soybeans in the world. A lot of our own food chain comes from there. So this is going to be deeply felt truly globally, um, some places worse than others. You know, I think that the projections are that Africa is going to get the worst of it because they, you know, they don't have like reserves. <laughs> Um, we might be able to get our soybeans someplace else, but we're going to we're going to directly feel the impact of this. I mean, there's headlines, you know, again of uh, Ukrainian farmers are putting putting on bulletproof vests to go, you know, take care of their harvest. It's it, it really is a very very large um, contributor to the world food supply, and it's planting season, right? I think I think the other thing is, uh, and we learned this. It, it, I mean, we learn it over and over again. We learned it in COVID, which was that in these catastrophic situations, the poor and underserved suffer the absolute most. Yes. I mean, the bit that we're witnessing here most acutely and we're up, yeah, upset about it rightfully is inflation, uh, inflation of oil prices, inflation that are passed on into food and uh, issues associated with supply lines. This is, 
as I said, uh, you know, we've seen over the last six weeks, Ukraine news fall down and down the order of business for news stations, generally, mm -hmm. newspapers, news stations, and it's really the most, whatever the most horrific thing of the day or the week is the thing that is being reported. But these deeper um, calamities in our society, which are inevitable in this type of scale of war, are really not being reported. And mm -hmm. then it's partly they're not being reported because the scale is so enormous, people barely get their minds around the little surface things of it, let alone to realize what's actually really happening. And I think that's where meetings like this are important. The people on this call can hear the scope of the problem that the globe is facing and maybe understand therefore how we must act now yeah. as opposed to waiting to hear what happens next in the next few years hoping that something will happen that will make all of this better. So speaking of act now, I've got two questions in the chat about how to act now. Uh, the first one is, is there an opportunity for medical personnel to go to Ukraine or Poland or Moldova or any of those places nearby to help? Should somebody get on a plane if they've got training or is it better to just send money? And the second question is, do you know of refugees who are coming here who we could help either as a community or as individuals? I, I, I will just say up front, just to get it out there, every component of what has just been said and more will count. From medics going out there, medics informing with in, information all the way to just raw large sums of money, you know, paying for, for Gennady's planes to bring, you know, severely injured children into European or US hospitals. So, I think the, the paralysis that can occur when you see something of such enormous scale is the problem. It's like, what am I gonna do? I don't have that much money to give, what do I do there? Every little thing that you can do will count. Think of those scenes where there's a fire raging in a house in the countryside and people are filling buckets individually from a lake and passing them down a chain all the way to put out this roaring fire. That's essentially one of the components that we have to do in addition to build, building fire engines and all the rest of the type of infrastructure to deal with the chaos that's been caused by the Russian army. But I, to remove the paralysis of what do I do, really almost anything will help in the context of where we are now from education to money, basically. So don't wait for the fire engine. Yeah. Get, the get into the line and, and be on the fire brigade. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, Paulina. Don't acclimate. I was just like, don't acclimate, you know, because I feel like the Johnny Depp trial is creeping up, you know, in, in the news. Now we have Roe v. Wade. They're, they're COVID resurging. It's just, we can't just sort of be like, oh, that's still... Yeah, com no compassion fatigue here. This is still raging. Yeah, so that actually leads into the next question. It'll be um, the last one before my last question. So this is the last participant question, which is, um, you know, how can we um, act together here? Is, are there large medical conventions that, that one might attend? Um, and should we perhaps put together a working group here in our synagogue, what's what's a helpful move? If you ask my perspective, it's to help uh, uh, the, the 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 injured patients when they come here. And as mentioned, Mark, in terms of donation, in in terms of going there, uh, Michelle, there is only like a level of medical personnel for refugee camp for primary care. There is no need for the surgical care yet in Poland, Romania. So it's uh, uh, so the, the 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 team from Mesh General and other institution went there, and there is mm -hmm. no uh, needs. The the Jewish agency for Israel reached me to yeah. join them in in May. So the point was to just to to organize the camp. 
Yeah, and, and Helen Scarlett also adds that engaging Ukrainian medical care providers is also a wonderful response to staffing shortages, um, perhaps all around the world, um, and to be helpful in that way. Um, Mark, one, one yeah, last comment on this, and then we're going to transition to my last question. Yeah, just very quickly, we would be, I mean, HUG is exactly, Maria described it better than anyone. We're, we're a integrating center, like a central station. We would love to work with a working group at Temple Emanuel to funnel the different aspects, whether it's fundraising, housing, education, medical, identification of medical needs that could be uh, um, assembled and then distribute them to the relevant uh, places in Ukraine as, as best as we can so that it's an efficient networked system to address the scale of this problem. And and then opening our homes when they come, Gennady, and uh, we're in on that. So, Pauline, Michelle, Michelle, I'm so sorry, can I just... Well, uh, I, I was just going to oh. add, you know, I, I'm familiar enough with Temple Emmanuel to know that there's a very accomplished and very impressive congregation. And so sometimes just that personal connection can be such a, a, a deal changer. Like I remember first few days when this started and, and I heard insulin, insulin, and you know, light bulb went off like, hey, my really good friend is married to someone who founded an online pharmacy. I bet he knows how to get insulin places. Um, so just like connecting people, sometimes you may not realize that you have resources we need like portable ventilators or, um, wound pumps or tourniquets and um or airplanes to get them there you know so so just also brainstorming uh and thinking outside the box about just like using those personal connections and professional networks about helping to solidify the supply chains join the bucket I also, brigade i also had a i also had a quick quick comment to make this is maria sorry i'm, I'm probably appearing in two screens at the moment um but my comment is as follows i think um if you have any congregates who are fluent in either russian or ukrainian and mm. english obviously uh, i think there is going to be a growing need for translation services either remote to help refugees who are traveling in europe or once people start coming to this country um help them navigate you know the system the immigration offices the the assistance programs, whatever it is that they need. I think if you can maybe assemble such a group um, on, on the level of your synagogue and just have them on the standby so that you know we or others can tap onto that resource as well. Thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Sold. All of you will be getting an email after uh, this conversation inviting you to join us in such a project. Um, so for my last question of the evening, you know, tonight we, as we're Meeting Yom Hazikaron, Israel's somber day of remembrance for fallen soldiers, transitioned as we were speaking into Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel's celebration of independence. Um, in this way, you know, every single year, mourning gives way to action, which gives way to hope. And in the midst of such a crisis, it's hard to find or see hope. But I want to ask each of you. Is there something either that you're doing or you're seeing which gives you hope? Well, I'll start by saying that the number of people on this call gives me a great deal of hope because people see and want to know at least what is going on. That's extremely important. The thing on this particular Independence Day, I would say, is the force for good and freedom for people is, uh, is a remarkable force. In other words, people who are free want to remain free and, and the tyrants always underestimate that. They always underestimate it. And Israel has faced its existential threats multiple times against ridiculous odds and I think that's the relationship we have when we see Ukraine battling so courageously is that same tenacity and courage to fight for your freedom, basically. And I just want to end with this point. We are all on that front line. We here, sitting in the safety of Newton, are on that same front line of fighting for freedom. And, and that's what should be motivating us to, to help Ukraine fulfill its freedom and drive back for freedom. 
Mm, amen. Paulina, Maria, Gennady, any of you? I, I actually, I, I agree. I, I see a lot of hope because of Israel's history, because who would have thought, who would have thought yeah. that they, that more than two months, they would have been able to fight this. And I, I, a part of me is like almost too scared to think, but like, my God, they might, they might be able to survive this. Mm. And what would that mean? I, I would say that the crisis like this brings out the worst and the best, right? Depending on the person, depending on the situation. Um, and I've so far in my friends and my colleagues, I have seen the absolute best being brought out by this crisis, personally, professionally, in all sorts of ways. And Michelle, that gives me great hope. Oh, amen, Maria. Thank you. Gennady. Well, uh, give me a hope that uh, we can uh, help more kids. And each saving life give me a huge hope and uh, energy to do it more and more aggressively to engage with your synagogue and other public uh, places to um, basically assist me with this. Well, if you save one life, you've saved the world. You've saved an entire universe. Thank you. I and was so <laughs> I want to I want to thank each of you for helping to inspire us, helping to give us a way to educate ourselves and to find a path to join that bucket brigade. We can't wait to do so with you. I will not say only Lila Tove. I will say to be continued. Thank you. Lila Tov, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this call. And we look forward to engaging with each of you in this really critical work. Thank you. Thank you to all of our amazing doctors. Thank you. Lila Tov, everyone. May we go to strength. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, Lila Tov.